Don't anybody get old. Okay. Hey, I'm Dr. Scott Worden, the TOS guy. Today we have a special treat. We have a round table of TOS specialists from all over the country. And we have taken questions from you, our viewers, patients, doctors, family members, and we're gonna answer some of the toughest questions we have about TOS. Let's start out by introducing our panel members quickly. First, Dr. Priyanka Ghosh, tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Hi, I'm Dr. Ghosh. So I practice in the Bay Area in San Francisco, Oakland, San Mateo region and Marin. Uh, I trained at UCSF, went to Boston on the Harvard programs, and then Memorial Sloan, HSS, and Cornell for my fellowship. And during those times, I saw thoracic outlet in multiple forms, whether with cancer patients, post-surgical, and I'm a practicing interventional pain physician. I have a special interest in this because it's pretty under-diagnosed and recognized. So luckily, I was able to collaborate with Dr. Newkirk and get more involved in treating patients with this. Awesome. Dr. Jenkins? Hi, I'm Dr. Arthur Jenkins, a neurosurgeon. I practice in New York and Connecticut. Uh, I used to be full-time faculty at Mount Sinai before I went into private practice. Uh, I trained uh, in New York uh, after medical school in, at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, but then uh, did a neurosurgery residency at Mount Sinai, fellowship in spinal surgery at the Brigham. Uh, full-time faculty used to be uh, you know, in, responsible for both minimally invasive programs and others. I got actually into thoracic outlet syndrome through the back door. I, I, during my training, did very little in the way of thoracic outlet. Although as a neurosurgeon, we did used to do numerous explorations of the brachial plexus for other pathologies. Uh, but uh, I discovered, a, invented a minimally invasive way of taking out cervical ribs. And as a result of that, um, started getting a lot of referrals for general garden variety, of which there's no such thing, uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, and then started collaborating with one of my vascular colleagues at Mount Sinai, and we developed a new minimally invasive way of taking out first ribs. So, uh, and one of the things that's really fascinating me about this particular group of entities, because it's not just one entity, is how little it's understood, how little the general uh, medical population understands it, uh, and really how there's such a, a crying need for more research and more understanding to really raise the bar for all of our patients. Awesome. And then Dr. Newkirk, who's been with us before. I'm a practicing neurologist, trained at University of Michigan, even my residency, but I've been in San Francisco since, oh my heavens, 1974. Um, I became highly interested in thoracic outlet syndrome about 30 years ago, mostly stumbling into the fact that this was a lot more common than people say. So I, my position is that textbook definitions are written by experts with specialties rather than people who wanted to understand the syndrome. So the only point I want to make as a neurologist is that this is a very common syndrome instead of a very rare syndrome. It's a compression of a neurovascular bundle. And I'm gonna say this 4,000 times given the chance, neurovascular bundles in all vertebrates have four components, nerve, artery, veins, uh, and lymphatics. If you look for all four components in your physical exam, you can make the diagnosis. So iconoclast that I am, Nearly everyone could have thoracic outlet, and probably everybody's had it briefly, momentarily. Oh, my arm went to sleep when I was sleeping. Well, if you think about where the compression was, it's pretty easy to figure it out. So if we look for nerve, artery, vein, and lymphatic changes, the diagnosis leaps out at us. Hopefully we can communicate that as we go along. Awesome. And uh, Dr. Newkirk is the most experienced person with TOS I have ever met. Uh, interesting, you brought up the word iconoclast. I'm Dr. Scott Worden, as I always introduce myself. I consider all of us and people who are progressive in TOS as iconoclasts. I trained and got board certified in internal medicine first at Duke and Boston uh, University. And then I went on to do more training in radiology at a place called Mallinckrodt Institute in St. Louis and a fellowship at Johns Hopkins in what we call cross-sectional imaging. 
And uh, like these other people, uh, TOS just kind of happened to me. Actually, I was very lucky. I had met Dr. Newkirk at a talk, and because of his amazing memory, several years later, he had a case sent to me for review. And it's been tremendous so far because for all of us, when we reach out to patients, we help a lot of people who can't get help elsewhere. It's also very intellectually stimulating, and I met some really amazing people through it. So having said all that, we have an interventional pain specialist, a neurosurgeon, a neurologist, and a radiologist slash internist. And that's just a start to our program today. Let's take our first question. Which physician specialist should I see if I think I have TOS? Art, why don't you take this one to start with? Well, I, I would say that the first step is always talk to your doctor, talk to somebody who knows you, but do so with a little bit of skepticism, knowing that your doctor probably doesn't understand much about it, but it would start with simply making sure it's not something else, okay? Uh, thoracic outlet syndrome is, um, is a bundle of diagnoses that all are related to some form of neurovascular, and God forbid it be a tumor that's causing this compression or something that, that a primary doctor should be able to see right away. After that, it comes down to a combination of what we call in medicine the three A's of building a practice. There's availability, ability, and affability. And you got to make sure that you find a doctor who is affable, understands and wants to talk to you about your problem, wants to listen to you. Second, they've got to have ability. They've got to have some understanding of what thoracic outlet uh, syndrome is. And, and there are a number of different people who have that and many who don't. Um, and then availability is, you know, sometimes it's hard to find a doctor near you who treats this condition. Um, for, you know, one of the good things that's come out of this global pandemic is that it's become much easier to get a remote consult with somebody who does understand it. Um, God knows, I think I do two or three of these uh, a week at least. Um, some days I see two or three uh, patients a day remotely with t just with TOS on top of all the other, you know, dozens of other conditions that I treat that are related to other spinal conditions. So. Uh, you want somebody who is affable is going to listen to you. Able has some understanding of the skill set, and that may, will include neurologists like Dr. Newkirk, uh, pain doctors uh, like Dr. Ghosh, um, or surgeons like myself and many of the vascular and thoracic and, uh, and, and neurosurgeons who will treat this condition. There are even some hand surgeons and shoulder surgeons who do treat it. I will tell you there are many people who don't treat it. They have no interest in treating it. And so you should ask that right up front. Is this a condition that one, you believe in, and two, that you treat if you think the patient has it? And, and most doctors will be pretty much up front, like, nope, that's not in my wheelhouse, or yes, it is. And let me explain to you why it's in my wheelhouse. Awesome. Tracy, if I could ask you, what's been your experience with which specialists in which medical specialties do you find TOS specialists? Well, almost nowhere. Uh, the, the least luck seems to come with orthopedics and neurology. The best luck seems to come with pain management specialists, some vascular surgeons, perhaps. Um, in rehab settings, uh, it's interesting when when people come to me from outside the Bay Area, most of the time the diagnosis was made by the physical therapist, not by the physician. But of course, the physician didn't listen. So that's why they moved out of county trying to find someone who was going to listen. So the, the most important thing is for patients to try to learn what the syndrome is. And it's very manifestations. It, it's a syndrome because symptoms come and go. They're not fixed and progressive necessarily like diseases or neurologic diseases in particular. And then what Art said was correct. Try to find somebody who will listen. And if you can get there, then progress can be made somewhere between thoracic, you know, rehab, interventional neurologic physicians, you can find somebody who will listen. But you need to have a physician who listens in order to make progress. Great. I, I will add that someone who's earlier in their career, like Dr. Ghosh, has impressed me with how much she has gone out of her way to learn, to ask questions, to find patients and be open-minded. So Priyanka, what's been your experience? What docs have you worked with 
who are aware of TOS? What would you recommend to patients when they want to find somebody? Yeah, so I think that everyone is right. You need a, a doctor who listens. And I think one of the things is with the global pandemic and the ability of video visits, if you can find people that are even out of state, you can do a visit with them. And then oftentimes, I usually do, but they'll be willing to talk to your primary doctor to kind of close the loop. And I very much see treating TOS as kind of a team sport. So I will generally um, reach out to the physical therapist, the radiologist, the neurologist involved, or I will get them involved. And so ideally, this is a team condition that you're treated with, and you kind of just need a main kind of coach. And so whoever is willing to do it, I think is fine, remote or there. I think you definitely need that person. That, that's a really great point. I think that's so true. If this were low-hanging fruit and easy to treat, we wouldn't be having these kind of meetings like this. I wouldn't have met people like R. Jenkins, Tracy Newkirk, Priyanka Ghosh, because it really doesn't depend on the specialty people are trained in. For me, my experience has been the people who have chosen to keep their mind open and who have taken the interest and pursued knowledge because it's not an easy disease. So um, when patients, all our viewers who want to find somebody, you're going to have to search for a TOS specialist first. And if you come to our website, we have a page that explains what some of the different specialists do. But we also provide a service. Get in touch with us and we'll steer you to good people. And Dr. Ghosh, do you do teleconsults? I do, yes. Okay, so we've got three people here who do. Our guest last week, uh, two weeks ago, sorry, Dr. Hagen, also does them. So we can definitely steer you if you live in the middle of nowhere and you don't have a TOS specialist, we can get you to a specialist. So viewers, if that's a question, reach out to us. All right, I'm going to move on to the next question. And this is one that an earlier talk by Dr. Jenkins, <laughs> I remember it well. Why is TOS so difficult to diagnose? So Art, I'm going to kick this one back to you first, because you did a very nicely detailed discussion of it on a previous talk. Well, uh, yeah, so how long do I have? No, I'm just kidding. Um, the, 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 I'm going to sum it up and just say that um, it's so hard to diagnose because it overlaps with so many other conditions, cervical spine, shoulder, chest, uh, muscle sprain, muscle strain, um, other types of injuries. Um, you know, it's just, it's a hodgepodge and understanding and differentiating and taking the time to do the, the, the multiple different physical tests and, and you know, anal analyzing, looking at blood pressure in the arm, looking at, at symptoms, looking at and checking them, doing an actual EAST test, which is, you know, well, where you have the arms up and you actually have to do it for three minutes to really do it properly. So it's not something that you can just bang a patient in and out and yeah. see, uh, and see patients in, 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 you know, 15 minutes or less and, and, and give them a reasonable answer. Um, and, and one of the, the problems with modern medicine is every doctor is on an RV, not on every, but many doctors, especially the hospital employed doctors, they're on an RV model. They've got to see a certain number of patients an hour. If they see, spend a lot of time digging deeper, they're not profitable. And so they have to move on. And so many of them don't even want to see TOS patients knowing that a good workup takes time and it takes listening and it takes takes actually, you know, ordering tests and analyzing them. Um, it's, uh, it's just, it's not easy. And it's easy to get misdiagnosed because if the first test that you get ordered, let's say it's a cervical spine and there's a little bit of something on the cervical spine, somebody who just wants to give a, an answer and get, get right. to the next patient will say, oh, it's a disc herniation. Yeah. So we're gonna do an ACDF, not understanding that 40% of people walking around with absolutely no symptoms at all, have findings on their MRI of the spine that might lead you in the wrong direction. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The patient has radiculopathy, nerve sensations on both sides. The doc orders a cervical spine MRI looking for anything. Yeah, so it's just, it's too easy to get off on the wrong tangent. Yeah. So it really takes a, a, a meticulousness and, a, and an ear for, listening to what the patient has to say, giving them a little time to describe it, asking the right questions at the right time in the conversation to draw out additional information. It just takes time. So an index of suspicion to start with and awareness of the disease before you even start. 
I, so I've Trump, often said, if I can't, I've often said, seeing is believing, but believing is necessary for seeing. Yeah, you see what you look for, right? Tracy, we've talked before about um, what a disc bulge can do and whether that mimics TOS or not, and also whether a standard neurologic examination rules out TOS. Do you want to comment on that? Standard neurologic examination um, depends on what one calls standards, but as as most of my neurologic neurologic colleagues do, it does not rule out TOS. But the, the point is the doctor doing the exam should understand what symptoms accompany the exam. And I've, I've reviewed literally without exaggeration, I must say hundreds of cases often done by neurologists. And in those hundreds of cases, I have not seen one comment about weakness of the shoulder blade muscles. We call them periscapular muscles. And it turns out that that might be the critical determining factor because weakness of those muscles triggered by problems with branches of the brachial plexus, the dorsal scapular nerve, creates a the collapse of the space that squeezes the brachial plexus and its blood vessels. So my, my way of doing this is to basically disagree with everybody. I think it only takes two minutes to pretty much prove if someone has thoracic outlet syndrome or not. And the extra step I add is if the patients show physical findings with symptoms that indicate compression or mechanical interference with nerves, blood vessels, and lymphatics, arteries, veins, and lymphatics, and then if I can do a maneuver that takes the pressure off those structures and the symptoms go away or grip strength increases, um, that's pretty convincing. Now, it can be verified with studies, but literally one can be more than 90% certain that a patient has a syndrome, not a disease or a tumor or a stroke or a disc or anything. You can do it in two minutes and come away with a high level, not proof, hear me clearly, not proof, but a high level of confidence that this is thoracic outlet syndrome. Well, I'm going to add here that Tracy, everybody who I talk to knows that you do an incredibly exhaustive examination. So when you recognize it in two minutes, that may be due in part to the fact you've been doing this longer than anybody and you've seen so many cases. So, it uh, helps. you know, two minutes is not going to be standard for a person, you know, younger in their career. It's it's hard, right? Now, what I, mean, I do should not replace a neurologic exam. I really didn't say it that way, but I cheat. I, I do <laughs> my two minute exam and then I make sure I didn't miss anything. But we can usually win the first two minutes explain why the patient has headaches why they have brain fog why they have tingling in their feet let alone neck pain and pain and or numbness or something in one or both arms and then we can go through any amount of detail to back it up priyanka you probably learned like other like medical students how to do a standard neurologic examination and now you probably do specialized exams when you suspect a patient has tos yeah, so I actually got some training in TOS because when I was at MSK, we had some patients, actually a fair amount from cancer-related issues that had thoracic outlet syndrome type um, syndromes or actually TOS. So I actually spent a fair amount learning the physical exam. And I do have a big cheat sheet because Dr. Newkirk lives 30 minutes from me. So I have met him in clinic. He has gone over the exam with me. I can ask him any exam questions I want and will be. So I think I've been really lucky in that. And honestly, nowadays with, you know, all the resources, there's so many resources to watch the exam, at the fidelity of it correctly. And I think that the way I look at it is you do have to rule out other things, though. I mean, you need a regular exam. I mean, this is not something that you should just jump to because you want to see it either. You know, the famous, if you have a hammer, everything's a nail. I keep an open mind when I do any physical exam. I'll include thoracic outlet type physical maneuvers because I think it's important even in an initial exam. But I mean, I will rule out other things as well. And so I think the newer generation somewhat, I hope, is at least getting trained in some of this. Um, and then Dr. Newkirk is kind of helping me along and along. I'm not gonna lie, I look at his notes and then whatever he has written for exam maneuvers, I look them up later and do all of them. So that's another way to learn. Yeah, we're, we're really lucky to have uh, Tracy around. Learned so much from discussing TOS with him over the years 
it's so easy to have TOS, in my opinion, and I'll defend that against anyone, frankly. But the real issue is, yes, let's start there and see if you do have it, but let's make sure there's nothing else going on at the same time. And the most obvious correlations would be the cervical spine, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, one's exam should be careful. You know, if there's a cervical root compression, none of the maneuvers for thoracic outlet syndrome will take those symptoms away. Whereas numbness in the hand, if it's due to the plexus, I can usually, unless it's far advanced, but I can usually clear it in 30 seconds by, by maneuvers that take tension off the plexus. And I know for sure that none of them affect the cervical nerve root. So there are a lot of shortcuts that we can do to lead us to a high probability to open the discussion for the patient, but carelessness never works. We have to make sure there's nothing else there. Great. I'm going to segue into our next question, which is, I've had multiple physicians tell me that my negative EMG indicates that I don't have TOS. And another question from a different source, what is the single best diagnostic tool for TOS? Uh, Pranka, how much experience do you have with EMGs and what tests do you consider helpful for the diagnosis? So, so I'm anesthesia, so I don't do EMGs. I have trained a lot in watching them and I read them a lot. I think EMGs are probably less useful um, for TOS. I feel they could be a tool, but I think the most useful um, things to diagnose it are really clinical history, physical exam, um, provocative maneuvers, and what Dr. Newkirk said, things that relieve it. And then honestly, the good radiologic studies. So the MRI, MRA, MRV that Dr. Worden is known for, not only is it great, because it's dynamic and there's multiple things looked at. It's also great because he is an expert in reading things for thoracic outlet and looking for it. So I would say not just a good radiologic study, but an excellent radiologist who reads it is probably the best diagnostic tool in addition to history and physical exam if I had to pick my favorite tool. You, you really make a compelling argument. I don't even know how to argue with that. <laughs> uh, Tracy, what about you? Well, Let's have Art tell us about his electrodiagnostic studies without the initials, by the way, Art. Don't you dare talk about SSEPs. Talk about words that we know um, as to why EMG can be useful if and only if you do it under the right circumstances. Yeah, you so got it, Art. Go. I get, so the e, uh, electromyography, uh, your a, AKA EMG, uh, is probably the least useful tool in terms of identifying uh, symptomatic thoracic outlet syndrome in, in IMHO, in my, in my humble opinion, uh, because the EMGs are never positive unless you already have atrophy. And if you have atrophy, you'll see that when you examine the patient and you say, hey, they got a divot in their hand or they've got a divot in their arm in, the, in a distribution that's relevant. They know that they've got a weak hand. They know that they have this. Um, any essentially any reversible condition, any condition that comes on and off is going to be negative on the EMGs. So it's it's really it's a useless tool for TOS. It is useful for ruling out other diagnoses such as cervical radiculopathy um, or nerve entrapment elsewhere in the arm um, or hand. But by the same token, it, it as TOS goes, it's really uh, not terribly useful. Um, I, I know that uh, Dr. Newkirk is, uh, is leading me into an area of uh, interest uh, that is more on the research side than on the clinical side right now, but we know that there are other electrodiagnostic tests that can be positive uh, in TOS in, that in positional uh, situations, um, and somatosensory evoked potentials and motor evoked potentials are, have been shown by uh, two different studies to have potential benefit for a diagnosing thoracic outlet syndrome. However, they are both somewhat uncomfortable to perform on awake patients. And so they're, um, right now we're working on trying to come up with a better way of doing that um, as a pre-operative, <clears throat> pre-evaluation diagnostic test that has sensitivity and specificity, that it's sensitive, it picks up the cases, and that it's specific you don't have a lot of false positives. Tracy? I'm fine with that. Remember, TOS is, is a compression syndrome caused by reaching. 
So most EMG or other electrodiagnostic studies that are done with the patient lying on the back, shoulder blades corrected, no mm -hmm. symptoms, EMG and the conduction studies are normal. If they were abnormal, the history should have pointed out some condition that would have made you suspect it would be normal. But basically, nearly 100% of electrodiagnostic studies are done under conditions that couldn't possibly demonstrate. As a matter of fact, I tell my patients, you have to have a normal EMG to get the diagnosis of POS. And it's like with concussions. If there's something abnormal on the MRI, it's not a concussion, it's something else. So understanding that normality is a necessity for certain forms of thought has escaped many of our colleagues. And again, if, if the same patient would, had a load on one arm long enough and the arm went numb, that's the time to do conduction right. studies. Which is never find something. So it's relatively simple thinking that if you create a, a normal condition for the patient, why would you expect the nerves to show anything wrong? Well, one doesn't. And in fact, I gave up doing EMGs, oh my heavens, 25 years ago, because I went years with never finding anything. And, you know, it's a futile search. So, but an insurance uh, company I, still demand them, right? Oh, oh yes. Oh, yes. That's, so that's I'm going to versus agenda. I got a delivery from Amazon yesterday. It's my new portable soapbox. People who know me, uh, they know that I always have a little soapbox I carry around. I'm going to share a little bit of stuff that I've said before in various pieces. But as I read more into the literature, and I love going back years in the literature, um, in 1970, a guy named Jalot, I mistakenly thought was at LSU. He was actually in London. He started publishing some papers. He was a surgeon, and they were on TOS. So he basically defined a few cases that had severe neurovascular compression, and he did surgery and he found that they were rubbing up against a sharp fibrous band associated with the cervical rib. Um, David Klein at LSU in the 70s did studies where they did EMGs intraoperatively and they found that those nerves were abnormal. But these docs had studied patients who had atrophy or wasting of the muscles in their hands. Now, later, uh, Asa Wilborn at Cleveland Clinic said, if you don't have a positive EMG, you have disputed TOS and I won't accept it. And the incidence of TOS is one in a million, which I don't think any of us believes is true. So what they set up is this artificial system where people with advanced TOS that had led to the point of motor nerve damage, and those are harder to damage than the sensory nerves. But once you get motor nerve damage, the EMG may turn positive, but you essentially have permanent damage. It's rare to recover that function and get that muscle back. So with every other entrapment neuropathy that we as doctors see, we don't wait to that point of motor damage. We try to find it early when it's only sensory before it transitions to a more severe form. And by the way, just as part of this soapbox, the whole disputed TOS thing, there's a medical phrase, uh, BS, because that's what I call it. It's just advanced TOS. And now, especially because of our awareness, because we have good docs like this out there, we're finding it earlier. So don't ever let a doc tell you that without hand atrophy, you can't have TOS, or without a positive EMG, you can't have TOS. That's completely wrong. Uh, other neuropathies, as I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, if you ignore a neuropathy that's got sensory symptoms and you ignore it long enough, it can turn into motor symptoms and then not frequently reversible. It's a transition and the same thing with TOS. So disputed TOS, if anybody brings that up for any of our viewers or any interaction you have with a doc, it's not disputed. It's just earlier TOS, which as Dr. Newkirk said, that's when you want to be treated. You want a negative EMG. All right, getting off my soapbox now, I'm going to go on to the next question. <clears throat> How do you measure the severity of TOS? For severe TOS, considering this as muscle atrophy, is conservative treatment an option? It's a great segue. Thank you for a great question. All right, so Art, I'm going to start with you because you see so many of these cases. How do you judge the severity, and then would you use conservative treatment if someone already had atrophy, as we were discussing? You know, I, I think I think that's uh, there's no specific you know cl classification that once you hit this point because most people you know, they have pain, they have weakness, they have numbness, they have atrophy. These are all part of a spectrum. Um, I, I look at it as how much is this impairing your quality of life? Um, and so if somebody has an accelerating symptom presentation, their syndrome is clearly getting worse. 
it is you've failed to other types of conservative treatment. Um, and there's different th types of conservative treatment ranging from rest to, uh, you know, attempting to uh, position this in, in a better way through hopefully guided, well planned out, hopefully um, edulo technique style uh, physiotherapy um, or other interventions. But if you're getting to the point where you have a physical structure that's blocking you, you've got atrophy, it can still get worse. You can have atrophy and the situation could still get worse. Um, and so it, it's definitely that's the point where there is no time to continue uh, conservative management once you get to that point, unless there's a really good medical reason why you're not healthy enough to have a procedure to try to make it better. Then you dial it back down. You give them what you can give them until you can get them healthy enough to give them what they need. Let me um, rephrase it in a way that I'm curious about. When you get a patient with a first diagnosis, you're making the diagnosis of TOS. How often would you go to surgery within a few weeks versus always, do you always try conservative therapy first? And do you change that period of conservative therapy if they're not getting results and go to surgery more quickly at some point yeah. with some indicator? In general, I try to give patients who have symptoms, especially symptoms that are intermittent, uh, symptoms that are clearly have a, a, a reasonable response to various more conservative interventions, somebody who's not disabled. Um, but say, let's say a professional pitcher or somebody who is, you know, really reliant on their craft or their art on that limb, and they, they can't do what they need to do, then those are people I would push sooner to surgery um, if you can't break the cycle. Now, if somebody like Dr. Ghosh is able to get an intervention that starts them and then I can get them into somebody right. who like, right. uh, you know, uh, you know, Scott, uh, Scott T or, or one of the other therapists are able to start to get some progress made. Yeah, absolutely. As long as you're making progress with conservative management, we continue that as long as it'll hold. Uh, but at some point you'll either plateau and it will be unacceptable or you'll plateau and it'll be acceptable. And that's, that's where the elective decisions go. But somebody who has a, an accelerating symptom pattern, that's a situation where I'm more likely to go in early rather than late. Somebody who has vascular compression, um, mm -hmm. somebody who has uh, a, really a potential clot aneurysm. And, and those cases, I absolutely get my vascular colleagues involved very early and very frequently. That decision is made very quickly. Okay, so what you're saying in answer to this question is we don't establish clinical criteria or some number some EMG value that states severity. It's based on how it affects their lifestyle, how much symptomatology and how much they need their arms and their, their freedom back to do what they're doing. And aside from that, the only other indication it sounds like is a vascular complication. Is that a fair statement of how you're addressing this if I capsule? Yes, and, and, and it gets back to the availability issue as well. Um, I would love to have the, 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 the bounty of, of TOS experienced therapists uh, that seems to exist on the, the West Coast here on the East Coast. If I look at, uh, for example, Edgelo uh, physical therapists who advertise that they have, you know, Edgelo training and that they are familiar with and skilled in, you know, TOS designed therapy, therapeutic interventions. There really aren't many out here on the East Coast. And sometimes the, the option is, well, do I treat them or do they get no treatment? Right. If they can get treatment, they get treatment. And, and there are a number of there are some pain management doctors I can get them into locally. Um, and if they can travel, I, I send them to to uh, experts who have more experience. But sometimes it's better to get some treatment than no treatment. Great. Uh, Priyanka and Tracy, do you have comments about severity, clinical severity, and decision making? Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Okay. Oh. Well, okay, then I add one thing. Um, I pay more attention than most people do to the fact that POS can produce local, regional, and systemic symptoms. And I think a lot about headache and tingling in the feet in parallel 
with one or the other upper extremity symptom. So one of the reasons, I mean, every year I send only uh, out of hundreds of patients, I only send one or two, maybe three of them in a whole year to one of the surgeons I trust on an acute basis, pounding my fist on the desk. We need to go in now. There are some crises diagnoses that I'm not going to bring up here, but it's all that happens. And the way I make that judgment is, first of all, I do my two minute thing to make sure I, I believe it's TOS and then a, a bigger exam to make sure it's nothing else as far as I can in one visit. But then thirdly, I try to reverse all the symptoms of the moment. And I do that with my, what we call a scapular maneuver. Think of the Nike swoosh. Basically, I take the shoulder blades and move them inward and upward and hold them. And it's important for the patient to understand that opens by a lever action, if you will, across the clavicles. Uh, it opens a space that contains the plexus. So if this, as we keep saying, is a neurovascular compression sy syndrome, and if the symptoms and disabilities are not permanent, in other words, we found out the MG is positive, then those symptoms that present at the moment that are due to compression of all those structures should be reversible. If I cannot reverse the headache, the tingling in the feet, the tingling and coldness in the hands, the grip weakness, then that's an urgent study for imaging and surgery. Most of the time, like nearly all the time, all, I can reverse all these things with a simple maneuver. And that's when I start talking to people about, all right, what does conservative care mean? What are the common mistakes that are made by therapists? It depends on what therapist I'm using and start them on the, the process of recovery. Then the point is we need follow-up to make sure if those steps are followed, the symptoms and the disabilities they cause should be diminishing. So it doesn't take long to tell all for all good hope whether or not we're on the right track or not. So for you partly, your ability to reduce symptoms helps you determine the severity? Definitely. Okay. If I can't reverse them, we have a big problem and we need to move right now. Excellent. Um, I want to point out, you mentioned about the clavicle, the collarbone, and for our viewers who've heard me say this before, this is something Dr. J brings up a lot. The uh, scapulae, the shoulder blades are free floating. This is why Dr. Newkirk can push them. If you're standing behind somebody, you can push them, you can slide them. So the, the shoulder blades just glide along the back of your chest. And the only bone that connects them to the chest is the collarbone but there's a series of complex muscles, 17 muscles in all, that are attached to the shoulder blade. So imbalance of these muscles, whether they're too weak or too strong or spastic, can change the position of those shoulder blades as well as generate their own pain. And when it changes the position, it changes the position of the collarbone. And because the first rib doesn't move very much, that can lead to compression or stretching. Um, Franca, anything to add about all this? Any I think they did a great job covering it, so I will not add anything. Let me add a comment then. It's sort of a value judgment about the importance of severity. So I base these judgments not on double-blind controlled studies because nobody in, on the earth has yet designed a double-blind controlled study for TOS. Uh, and I didn't break that precedent after 30 years of this, but, well, 50 years of it, I have to confess. But if a patient has thoracic outlet syndrome for six months, it literally takes us about six months to clear it. Hmm. We've had it a year, it takes a year to clear it. If it's longer than two years, and I confess, I can't clear it all the way back to normal. Hmm. And remember, the activities and thoracic outlet syndrome is a disorder of reaching. Therefore, without extremely careful counts counseling, all the activities of daily living once the syndrome is started, make it worse. So it's a naive point of view to think that we'll just do the right treatment and things will get better. Oh, it takes rather pointed and continuous counseling to make sure people try to stay within the limits that can be sustained by their periscapular muscles. Tracy, have you noticed in the time we've worked together, and I have not the experience you have, but we've been working together 20 years probably, have you noticed uh, patients coming in to see their doctors sooner or getting diagnosed sooner than they did 20 years ago? 
Oh, there is a trend. It's still way below what I'd like to see happen. Yeah, word spreads and, you know, modern communications get information out. There's a lot of disinformation, as we already know from politics and, and other things. Right. So our, our profession is not free of that in any means. But my, my message to all of this is this is a physical compression syndrome. It has a number of reproducing findings. There are some simple exam steps that the patients can even do for themselves to help verify or increase the probability that this is a special neurovascular compression syndrome. Once symptoms are correlated with a few simple anatomic findings, we get back in the real world and steps can be taken to modify the anatomy. Remember, this is all about anatomy. Anatomy that's disordered causes dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Always, mm -hmm. always, always think anatomy. And you mentioned disinformation. This is another little pet peeve of mine, my soapbox. Um, and Art, we've discussed this before. Uh, social media is out there and it's really, really powerful. Um, but we find some patients coming to us, I'm sure you've all had this experience where a patient comes to you with an unusual request or unusual unexpected information because of their interactions on social media. Art, you phrased this really great before. What's your approach to how people should use social media? Sorry, I'm not sure which uh, which uh, aphorism you're you're referring to, but um, I, you know, social media is something that should be taken with a grain of salt. There's no peer review on the internet, um, and so you know, there's you, you one needs to have a healthy skepticism. You know, you have to have hope, but you also have to have insight and wisdom as to when you're being led astray, and that's hard for people who are desperate. Uh, there's no limit to what uh, desperate patients will allow somewhat unscrupulous or well-intentioned but uninformed physicians to do to them. Uh, and so I, I always try to focus on making sure that whatever I do is scientifically and evidence-based uh, and that I'm offering them a, a balance of options. We go through the risks, the benefits, and all the alternatives before we, we decide on a particular pathway. Um, it's, it's hard, it's hard managing, uh, people's expectations, uh, especially when you have no input into where they're getting it from. And, and Priyanka, you and I, in particular, we've shared a patient not too long ago that, um, presented some challenges, I'm sure, in terms of getting information from so many different places. Yeah. I mean, I think that we are definitely, my generation, all of us are in this era of social media and getting diagnoses from their information, peer sourcing. And some of that is good. I mean, I think having support groups, having knowledge is excellent. I will say, I think the best way to verify or um, kind of know your information is reasonable is see the experts. And if you aren't happy with something they said, or you're not sure, or you want you know someone else to look at it, I would get a second opinion. And again, we said, you know, virtually you can do a lot of these. I would still trust more the experts. I think your peers are great. And I think that they have a lot of helpful things to do. But I think that presenting experts of different specialties and different, you know, treatment paradigms is your best bet to assure that your information is correct and not, you know, incorrect. And the patient we're talking about, both Dr. Ward and I told them something very specific. And yeah. That was fine. They continued ahead and got a second opinion. And actually what happened was the information was the same as what we'd said, which I think you'll see more commonly than not comparing social media to, you know, the experts' opinions. I think generally we will overall agree on many things. And you should get second opinions, regardless of where you get your information. I think it's helpful. So social media is a great place to find the experts, but it's not the experts. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard for social media to also diagnose you. They're not seeing you. They don't know your story. And so I would also be very careful about that. Yeah. And while we're on this the subject of social media, I'm going to remind our viewers, please help us out and mash the like button. Take a look right now and find like or subscribe or you can even do both, especially if you have TOS. I want you to go slowly, though. OK. All right. Let's look at our next question. Uh, I've heard in many of your talks that TOS symptoms can be caused by many different compression points. Can the speakers discuss these possibilities? Um, Art, you're an expert on anatomy. 
<laughs> well, I think uh, being an expert on anatomy is a, is a combination. It takes a combination of things. One, it takes a certain amount of interest, uh, and then it needs takes a certain amount of practice. Um, so I've I've studied a lot of different aspects. I've taken uh, anatomy and surgical dissection courses on the brachial plexus with Dr. Klein before he retired, uh, and so this has always been an interest of mine. Um, but it's it's the application of that knowledge that creates wisdom and insight. Um, and so you, when, when we think about what differentiates thoracic outlet syndrome from other conditions and where it's sim- where the the compression is derived from, um, I really th- I like to think of it in, in about four primary regions. Um, the first is in the the rarer uh, in the cervical rib situations where it's actually being compressed as it leaves the spine and goes and essentially gets caught in between the cervical rib. Interestingly enough, I have seen some wild anomalies regarding cervical and first ribs um, as a result of this interest. I mean, I've seen bifurcated ribs. I've seen cervical ribs that actually articulate onto the first rib. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. The, the types of, and, and the location of the compression and the and the, the nerve pattern, the nerve distribution is different for cervical ribs because it's much more of a C7 problem than a C8 problem. But still you've got, um, so one point of compression is by the cervical rib, which can be both a bony rib or it can also be a fibrous band. Second is in the scaling triangle region. And there are multiple, because there are three scaling muscles, there are multiple points where, and because the scaling muscles actually inter, uh, interact between the spine and the, um, and the two ribs, the two first ribs, when you only have a first and a second rib and not a cervical rib. And so these different triangles that they form can cause a focal compression on uh, on the nerves of the brachial plexus as they come out of the spine. Uh, and then there is the costoclavicular region um, where there are multiple different ways in which that can be compressed. There's fractures, there's inflammation, there's the subclavius muscle, there's the multiple different issues that can contribute. And then there's also a, 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 a apical lung lesions um, that can typically cause compression in that region. Um, one of the fascinating things I found about what, looking at the anatomy of, sir, of the patients with costoclavicular uh, compression is that the first rib remodels and goes from being an airplane wing shape to a almost flattened, more like paper, uh, as the, the chronic irritation remodels the surface of that bone, essentially flattening it out, making it thinner. Um, it's palpable when we get in there. Um, and then the, there's also um, pectoralis minor region uh, compression where you can have bowstringing uh, by the, uh, the, the pectoralis minor tendon, which attaches to the second and fourth through fourth ribs um, against the, uh, the uh, corcoid process of the, uh, of the scapula itself. So these are the areas that I typically will examine for um, for, for focal compression, just to regionalize it, to identify better where and how one might want to consider treating it. And those treatments may involve, you know, uh, the Botox or other lysis, uh, of the, the adhesions in the area, Botox to relax the muscles, uh, as well as, um, high, you know, there, there are just numerous other treatments that I'll let Dr. Ghosh discuss in, in a little more detail. But to, to first, the, first you got to figure out where the compression is coming from, before you figure out what the appropriate next uh, therapeutic interventions would be. Great, that's a great detailed description. So my job as a radiologist is anatomy, applied anatomy, and uh, I will tell you this: learning the thoracic outlet <clears throat> has been one of the toughest things I've ever done. Yeah, not only is it a very complex area, the junction between the neck and the shoulders and the chest. But uh, every patient seems to have a different variant. My understanding is that there's a solid sheet of muscle on each side in the embryo. And as the nerves start growing, they split that muscle into separate muscles, the three scalenes. But that split is not always the same. It's not always even, not even side to side in the same patient. So as the nerves leave the spine, the neural foramina is the side hole of the spine. As the nerves leave there, 
to our question, um, it enters a little fatty space right over the top of the lung. And uh, apical, meaning top of the lung tumors, as Dr. J just mentioned, can sometimes involve the brachial plexus, but they are rare. And in that spot also, that's where you'll find cervical ribs and the fibrous bands associated with them tending to affect this. And then the nerves pass between the anterior and middle scalene muscles, which may or may not be split into two separate muscles. They may have interdigitating bands. They may insert too broadly on the first rib. All of these things can narrow or trap the nerves. The nerves can also go around the muscles or through the muscles instead of in that convenient space. And then you get to the space between the collarbone and the rib, the costoclavicular interval, which everybody's rib is a different shape, it seems. And I hadn't heard of this remodeling. And everybody's collarbone is a different shape. And the collarbone moves in three dimensions as you move your arms. So if and where it compresses things against the rib, is you can't guess ahead of time. You have to see it through imaging. And then the nerves enter the space behind the pectoralis minor muscle. Classically, retropectoralis minor syndrome or pectoralis minor syndrome is described as a compression. I can tell you from the literature and from my experience, that's really rare. What I think is happening is that that pectoralis minor is affecting the position of the shoulder blade. When you raise your arms, the nerves actually slide from the narrowest spot of that space into the widest spot of that space. So it doesn't make sense that raising your arms would cause narrowing and compression. But what does happen in some patients is as the nerves start sliding upwards when you raise your arms, they get trapped underneath a little bony process called the coracoid and they can get stretched there. So we know docs like these experts here do upper limb neural tension tests. They look to see if the nerves are gliding easily, sliding easily. And they may be trapped from scarring or inflammation, but they may also get hung up under like this bony hook and not have enough flexibility to slide. So that's kind of an introduction to some of the anatomy that I look at. I don't know if somebody wants to add something else in terms of anatomy. I'm going to go on to the next question then. Let me add one negative comment. The last, I think, seven patients I've seen with cervical ribs all got better and we never touched the rib. So everything that's been said here about pathologic anatomy is correct. But whether it necessarily governs the source of symptoms in each patient remains to be demonstrated. So therefore, any method that's available that opens a space that contains all the components of the, the plexus and its vessels and lymphatics could produce an outcome irrespective of the pathologic anatomy. That doesn't mean I ignore it, heavens no. The pathologic anatomy may guide our focus but not necessarily control it. So we have to pay attention to all of the anatomy in a neutral position, yes, but how does that anatomy change if the mm -hmm. shoulder blades are strong enough to hold the, the, the intervals open right. properly? Right, because the patient has had, patients had a cervical rib their whole life. Why do they get symptoms now? Right? There we go. So yeah. it's, I, I, it may be important, but maybe is the word, not that it is important. I will bring up a couple points here. Uh, cervical ribs have been found dating back to mummies from Egypt. A guy named Gruber in, in 1875 described four types based on their size. I don't think that's important, but he was one of the early describers, not the earliest. <clears throat> Adson, uh, the father of modern neurosurgery, right? In uh, 1927, published a paper which has beautiful illustrations by hand, but his approach was very different than anybody else's at the time. At the time, there was something called cervical rib syndrome. In the 1920s, they had x-rays. They took these patients with these neurovascular symptoms and they would do an x-ray and they'd find a cervical rib in some of them. And then in those cases, surgeons would try to remove the surgical rib. Not always an easy thing, I'm sure. But what Adson said was, well, this is an enclosed space. Why don't I remove the anterior scalene muscle? and then the plexus can just slide forward. Who cares if you have a cervical rib? Now, it turns out that he had a lot of recurrences. He only did a scalenotomy, which is just cutting it off the first rib and letting it dangle there. Well, we don't know because we don't have modern imaging. Maybe patients develop scar tissue afterwards. I don't know, but I would bet in some of them that there wasn't space for the plexus to slide forward. Yes, you remove the scalene, but if they still had a tight costoclavicular interval between the collarbone and the rib, maybe they're just wasn't enough space. 
but but it was a very novel approach and it was a lot easier procedure than uh, cervical ribs. And Art, I don't know if you know much about this this episode of Adson's work because he did so much. But yeah, it's interesting to yeah. read his papers. No, it's 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 interesting to see sometimes what's old is new again. But you know, one of the things that that getting back to what Dr. Newkirk said about the the weakness of the 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 support of the scapula and this this is often a both it's a reaching problem but also a a sagging of the scapula problem when the so the you you mentioned the three dimensions that the scapula that the that the clavicle moves it actually moves in six dimensions because it has pitch roll and yaw that it actually rolls when you lift your arm up the, the scapula the clavic, the, the clavicle also rotates around and it's the process it actually rolls back on over the clavicle right. um, and that's that, that was one of the things that I found fascinating about the mechanics but also when the scapula sags the arm goes up but the scapula comes down so it actually creates a kinking a sharp angle right. of the neurovascular bundle under that coracoid process and and so I suspect that there's some downward pulling of that of the coracoid onto Absolutely. a plexus that's going down and then pulled down more but the arm goes up which puts it under tension again it's, so it's, it's what we could call bow stringing like correct pull right and correct. yes anyway so th these so that gets back to once again you know what these are all different and and yes certainly uh, i also find that that uh, the the pec minor syndrome certainly has an I, a standalone entity is is much rarer than the other types. Um, although sometimes I'll see it in conjunction with other points of compression mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And and I'll add one more thing that no one has ever written a paper showing a statistical correlation between cervical ribs and TOS or any other syndrome like that. About maybe even half of a percent of the population has cervical ribs of one size or another. But I don't think they're all people with TOS. So it's something to look for, but by itself, the presence of a cervical rib does not define TOS. I'm not gonna go on to the next question. No, let me just add one more thing because I, I so misrepresented. All the people out there should remember that the presence or ad, absence of an adsense sign or adsense maneuver literally proves nothing. Hmm. It's a symptom. It, it, I use it to judge the, the adequacy of the corrections I create with the orthosis that I do, but never, never for a diagnosis. Why? I can have a patient with an arterial brewery, and a brewery means there's noise in an artery because it's being compressed or occluded either way. But with scapular maneuvers, I, I can make the acids come and go, vary in intensity. I can even switch sides. So the maneuver is a, is a, only a, a measurement of arterial flow at a certain time in a certain position. And it tells us absolutely nothing more than that. So any physician arguing that there's a diagnosis, let alone syndrome present because Adson's is positive or, or, or not, is dead wrong. It simply proves nothing. It's only a tool to be used in the, in the larger evaluation. So AdSense test for our viewers is where your doc feels the pulse in your radial artery, puts that arm down by the side, right? And there's an AdSense and a reverse AdSense, but it basically involves turning your neck and taking a deep breath in. Right, Tracy, you do these more than, than I do. Exactly. And, and the assumption that AdSense made in the 1920s was if he could compress the artery, he was probably compressing the nerves because they're kind of close. But all those kind of's don't really add up. And we know now that compression of the artery is independent of compression of the nerves. But that was what he had at the time. Right. Yeah. Um, Fair enough. And I will point out that a lot of these test docs use an AdSense test, a ruse test, uh, you know, uh, a right maneuver, a right test rather. Um, all of these have been shown to be pretty so-so. You know, we're talking to people here who have seen lots of patients and they know TOS when they see it because they smell it. But uh, number one, none of these tests is diagnostic. They're not even close to diagnostic. They're just combined along with clinical judgment. Number two, they don't show the underlying anatomy or cause. And we know from history of all the medical literature, there are many different types of TOS wrapped up in here. You listen to Dr. Jenkins talk about all the anatomy. Well, any abnormality of that anatomy can cause a different syndrome. Right, Art, you mentioned that cervical ribs tend to be associated with C7 pathology, right? Yeah, that's correct. Right. So 
this uh, patient but, who doesn't have but, a cervical rib can have upper trunk disease. You know, a lot of but patients. The word is, and the word is tend to. Right? Yeah. Because like that's you right. said, not right. every patient is exactly the same. Right. And that's why I'm not tuning my own horn, but I think imaging, proper imaging, really answers a lot of the questions that helps these experts make their judgments. So um, there are some like vascular surgeons in their literature, they just scoff at the idea of imaging, uh, which is unfortunate because the tests that they use, uh, you know, an AdSense test or Roos test don't have great numbers, really. So imaging is way better than that. But, you know, this is what we deal with because as doctors, we're also human. So people form their opinions. I'm going to, that's another soapbox, by the way. Um, Let me add to your soapbox, so there's another observation here I think is critical. The, the MRI that you do, the TOS that look at all this, is far and away the best test. Remember, that underestimates the compression simply because the patient's lying on the back, the body's compressing the scapulae, and that that opens the cost of particular right. Costal angle, costal particular angle, excuse me, I can't speak English. But the end of my day, I suppose. At any rate, it underestimates. So the same picture would change dramatically in an upright position, especially with fatigue, especially while reaching. And furthermore, if there's load. So the, right. it's, a, it's an anatomic guide that, in my opinion, is indisputable, but how bad it is, how fast we move, all these kinds of things then has to be thought out carefully. Well, thank you for bringing that up. There are, I think I have five papers from the 1960s where people would do direct angiograms, inject the arteries with dye, and they did it with the patients lying down on their back and also the patients sitting. And they clearly showed, at least in these low numbers, that the arteries were more compressed when the patients were sitting. And it just makes sense with gravity, even just the weight of your shoulders without a load, without carrying anything, that the shoulders are going to push down. And Art referred to this before about the the complex motion of the shoulder blades. So yes, probably the MRI does underestimate that degree of compression. But um, you know what? We're all working in the dark here and we're all adding more information. There's no standard that has to be perfect. I believe, honestly, truly to my core, imaging helps a ton. It's not perfect and it doesn't have to be perfect because the bar is really relatively low. <laughs> so I, I keep getting on my soapbox here. All right, next one. <laughs> I love this. It's great to hear all these great minds. Um, all right. Uh, no, no. Can any type of TOS cause referred pain in the upper trapezius, levator scapulae, and periscapular area? And if so, why would that be? Um, Pranka, I'm going to ask you, how much of this is like direct nerve compression or referred pain in your uh, opinion? So I think that that's the question of the day. Every hour of any syndrome I see, because I'm a pain doctor, so I think that there's always, so I always ask the patient essentially kind of a overall holistic thing, like what causes the pain, what brings it on, what makes it better, you know, yeah. do some provocative testing to look at the imaging. I think it depends on the patient. I think there are some that have it from direct nerve innervation. I think a lot of it is compensation pain. A lot of it can be either your muscles compensating and reacting yeah. to stimulus or having to balance itself. The other part can be your body, especially when the younger people, it will, your body's smart, you're young, it will modify itself in different ways to decrease pain and also dysfunction if it can. So it really depends on the scenario. I always look at patient's functionality, what causes it, and imaging, of course, physical exam, of course. I think Dr. Kirk is absolutely right about provocative tests and what can decrease it and what can um, take away headaches, things like that. So. With those maneuvers, you give yourself more information. But I think that to a large extent, it's also dependent on the functionality, what happens in their daily life. You know, I think observing gait, observing motion, observing different movements they do, and is that something that might be causing it? I think there's a lot of reasons it could be, which is true in any other type of pain as well. And so I always keep an open mind about what it could be. So, you, so patients guard, they assume positions to protect the most painful compression of the nerves. I think they can do that. I think that they, their bodies independently can just, well, sometimes if you're feeling weak, you'll use other muscles that you've never used uh, to compensate for it. And those muscles, if they're not particularly used, so the example I give is if you play golf, most people will laugh, but it actually will make you very sore normally after playing if you don't play it, then do not use those muscles. And so it can be a combination of all those things. And then of course it can be direct nerve innervation causing the pain. So, I mean, I think there's a whole lot of reasons it can be caused. It can be sleep, it can be your positioning. So there's a lot of, a lot of 
can have the pain. Right. I can, I can say anatomically, I know the long thoracic nerve goes through the middle scaling muscle. It can be one nerve or three or four bundles. Uh, Rob Hagen, our guest from a couple of weeks ago, would talk about how hard it is sometimes to dissect that nerve out. So if you've got a spastic muscle, the middle scaling is tight, right? You could be causing all these problems to the C5, C6, C7, the muscles up here. Um, Tracy, your thoughts on this referred pain versus direct, you know, radiculopathy. Let's start this way. If one does a surgery that's really, really good and all the identified structures and vessels of the brachial plexus are relieved, one or two sides, the argument can go either way. The patient's likely to have tremendous improvement in headache, complete disappearance of symptoms in the feet, wonderful improvement of grip strength, freedom from numbness in the arm, but they're still likely to have chronic neck and bilateral upper shoulder pain. So we often, for lack of knowledge, refer to it as, as TOS-induced chronic myofascial pain. Mm. But I'm very clear after watching over the years a couple of hundred surgeries, that doesn't go away. However, scapular, here I go again, but if we put the shoulder blades back in place and hold them there, and I have, a, you know, there are a variety of ways of doing that, then Range of motion of the cervical spine improves and the chronic neck and shoulder pain literally goes away. Absent that correction, you can have a great decompression, great arm function, and still have chronic neck and shoulder pain, which patients, unfortunately, are taught, well, uh, you're under stress, uh, you know, you have bad posture without ever saying why they have the anatomy of bad posture. So that persists independent of the direct mechanical vast interchange in the plexus. Now, why does that persist? And what does referred pain mean? And what are spinal cord adjustments for postural problems? How does the spinal cord correct, protect peripheral nerve and blood vessels? Unfortunately, after all this time, that's still over my head. I'm not sure. I have some thoughts about brainstem physiology that may well influence this, but I confess I proved nothing all I know is the outcome. I know how to make it better, but I don't know exactly why. Art, so any comments? I, yeah, I would just say that I think that getting back to Dr. Newkirk's point, that the body tends to do its best to try to stabilize an existing problem and muscle spasticity. And I, I see this in cervical spine. I see this in TOS. I see it in a lot of other conditions where they you know, people be like, oh yeah, you just have some muscle spasms. Why do you have the muscle spasms? You have the muscle spasms because your body is trying to stabilize an area. It's trying to elevate, it's trying to do something and it's doing it the only way it knows how. And so if you fix, you can fix the compression and you may make the arm symptoms better, but if you haven't fixed the scapular stability, that scapular instability will still be there with a decompressed nerve. Um, and, you know, by the same token, if, you know, we, we know, for example, in cervical myelopathy, patients often get pulled into a kyphotic position because that alleviates the compression on the spinal cord posteriorly and where the ligamentum flavum is being stretched out and is no longer buckling in. So it's a functional uh, modification. It's a spasticity of your sternocleidomastoid muscles that have caused you to pull your head forward to protect you from the problem that happens when your head goes back. Same thing I think happens with the, the, the TOS areas. Your body is trying to hold your shoulders up. It creates muscle spasms. I think some of those headaches are muscle tension headaches where the muscle hmm. inserts on the back of the head, the, the entire rector spinae group at usually right at this line here. It starts here and then radiates forward along with the galea and the, the, uh, the occipital frontalis muscles. But it's these are definitely issues that are related to chronic instability in your body's reaction to it. Um, in, in addition to that, there's also some deep referral patterns where the body puts on the surface a problem that exists deeper down. Like heart attacks, we know there's nothing wrong with the left arm, but they get pain that shoots into the left arm. That's just where the brain puts deep cardiac pain. And there are some other areas where you can get rep referred pain into the intrascapular, parascapular area. Right. Like we learned in medical school, gallbladder pain can cause left shoulder pain, I think. Yeah, it's just this weird wiring that some people have. So um, interesting, you, you mentioned um, 
I, I wanted to go back a couple sentences and I'm blanking on oh, headache. So patients with TOS commonly get headaches. And is the thought that there are different etiologies of it as you're hinting at? Let me start with that, if I may. Um, the, in my opinion, the headache pattern that's most common, poorly recognized in TOS is migraine. Whether or not there is an issue, and whole symposiums have, have gone up in fire over this, whether there really is cervicogenic headache or not, is a very, very, very long, complicated discussion. Certainly, neck pain conditions are associated with headache, but by which pathway is highly debatable. So I don't deny the connection, but I will argue with anybody's explanation about why it's true. One step, though, that I know is true, having done this, I'm sorry, thousands of times, is back pressure from the superior thoracic aperture up the neck through the valveless external jugular veins is, and the word cause or trigger can be debated for the next two hours, and I promise you we won't do that. But back pressure in the valveless external jugulars does, one way or another, create headache. That headache can be reversed essentially immediately with bilateral scapular correction. It can be relieved eventually without that correction by using the new headache, med they're not medications, they're immune agents, anti-CGRP agents. So we know for sure, clinically speaking, that's not a laboratory point, it's a clinical point, that these are migraine, and I can pretty much show the trigger is the back pressure in the jugulars, and we know how to reverse that. So chronic headache and longstanding POS syndromes can be markedly improved with mechanical correction, but imperfectly. It won't, this correction will not clear up all of the headaches. Why? As Art and Priyanka have pointed out, there is a cervical component of some kind and again, it's beyond the scope of this discussion to say what it is, because I don't believe the books at this point. Uh, but the, the myofascial condition clearly contributes, but probably in a half a dozen different ways. If one recognizes that this headache syndrome is multifaceted, multifactorial, then I, I now have many, many, many patients who don't have headaches at all anymore. But it was never done with a single step. I'm going to move to the next question. I think that's great. So we have at least two etiologies, muscle stress, uh, occipital headaches, and vascular congestion and dysregulation. But yeah, so there's multiple etiologies, just like there's multiple etiologies of TOS. Is that a fair statement? Oh, absolutely. Okay. The next question, Tracy Newkirk, you're going to handle this first. Can TOS result in symptoms in my legs and feet? Absolutely. Um, lower... Okay, non-radicular non low back pain, so pain that stays in the low back but doesn't go anywhere, not the pain that's in the low back that radiates in the buttock or down the leg. That's a different issue entirely. Even Art will agree with me on that one. But bilateral, continuous, low grade to moderate low back pain together with any type of aching and or sharp shooting pain in the inguinal region together with intermittent tingling of either or both feet can be attributed to thoracic outlet syndrome. Now, I've had more than 50 neurologists look at me in horror. There are no nerves that go from the brachial plexus down to the feet. Okay, that's entirely true. It, up, it innervates the upper body. But there are, and I believe these are venous changes at brainstem level triggered by the back pressure, not only through the external jugular veins, but probably some of the vertebral veins that create a biologic change in the brainstem that creates, well, actually there's even a form of gait disturbance, a truncal ataxia that occurs in this syndrome. And the only defense I have, because there are no imaging studies, there are no electrodiagnostic studies yet that support this, is if one corrects the shoulder blades, both of them completely either with your hands, with taping, or with the orthosis that I use, all of those symptoms go away simultaneously within two minutes. And I, please hear me only that, you know, I can't prove it. I don't have it. Scott hasn't given me the right MRI to prove it. Uh, the EMG people haven't proved it. But I've only done this, well, well over a thousand. Well, no, I've done it two or three or four thousand times by now. It turns out the same way 
every single time, except in those sad cases that are so far down the road that we just can't reverse it anymore. Even then, surgery doesn't reverse it. And that's not the fault of the surgery. It's the fault of the timing. So there's absolutely no question in my mind, and I will defend this against anyone, that lower body symptoms are vascularly, I think, related to thoracic outlet syndrome. And um, there's some literature out there on what happens when you compress the veins. In this case, uh, to my very superficial reading, the veins of Batson's plexus surrounding the spinal cord, the blood has to flow up to the skull base and then down through the jugular veins to the heart. So there are points where it could be congested. The spinal cord could have some venous congestion because there's too much pressure in the veins. I, I mentioned a paper on dogs that banded off the inferior vena cava. They found that venous congestion would cause breakdown of the blood nerve barrier and the dorsal root ganglia. In other words, the nerve bodies for the sensory nerves would break down and the vessels would be very leaky just because of this low pressure increase in the veins. So there is, you know, potential mechanism here. I'm not sure how to find it with imaging, but um, we know that patients get venous congestion of their upper extremities. You always test, Tracy, to see what their veins are doing. And, and we believe that contributes to the damage to the nerves. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah. and, uh, and like there are other people like Dr. G, Gar Dr. Gargoslu in Florida, uh, we've discussed this and he's very strong um, on that he thinks the veins contribute a lot to TOS. So it's one of those fields we're just learning about, hopefully. All right. Um, Actually, if, if I could just throw in two absolutely. seconds, I, I want a sh uh, little shout out to one of my vascular colleagues, Dr. Windsor Ting, who's an absolute genius on this subject. Uh, and there is a condition called May Thurner syndrome, May hyphen Thurner, T H U R N E R, that involves all of the what you're describing in terms of the vascular, uh, the anastomoses, the the connections. Uh, and, and through the Batson's plexus and other venous uh, anastomoses that does. So I, I would agree with uh, what Dr. Newkirk is saying in there. And it, this is certainly uh, one of the mechanisms, not by, not necessarily the only, but um, where you can have, sometimes you get treatment of the lower extremity obstruction, venous obstruction, and the TOS gets better. And clearly you can treat the TOS and the lower extremity can get better, that there is some process by which venous uh, equilibration results in focal compression of small vessels, not just the big vessels. Right. Which is great. Kind of a subclinical edema that the blood can't drain from the body fast enough. And you just get this kind of build up a fluid, if I can oversimplify, which I'm good at. Um, well, just kind of curious. Analyze you just one more observation. Can I, have, can I ask you a question first, Tracy? Have you sure. seen many patients with Mayferner syndrome? Probably, but I've been poor in recognizing it. So I, I'd say yes, but I've not been able to define it very well. I, I get mixed up in too many extra findings that I have trouble sorting out. So I think the answer is yes, but I'm not quite smart enough to, to, to prove it. I think it would be good to talk to Art's uh, colleague with the four of us, uh, five of us, and, and get um, see what things are common. I'm definitely open to learning. Um, we have um, we have a choice. We can take questions from current participants, or we can uh, take some questions that have been pre-sent in. And right now, I'm being uh, given a message, David, who has who we've traded a few emails. David says I was involved in a motorcycle accident and suffered a chest wall contusion, and my rib cage by my armpit, also was hit in the chest under my collarbone by the throttle. Uh, none of this sounds like fun. It was getting tingling down my hand, aching in my elbow. I thought it would pass, but started developing a winged scapula and then severe pain for eight months of physical therapy. Now my arm is turning colors. I tested positive on the uh, coastal position for TOS. Um, not sure, uh, we'll ask. My physicians are dismissing it because they said 5% of people will test positive. David, do me a favor. I'm not sure what test or position you're talking about for TOS. Are you talking about arms up, this stick them up thing? Send us another comment. Um, Art, do you have uh, thoughts just reading about this motorcycle accident? Yeah, I, I'm just shuddering thinking about the, the he's being blown off on these these issues. I, I think that if, you, if you're not getting... Um, 
a, a favorable review. This goes back to the they have to be affable and they have to be listening to you. Um, I would never dis, di, dismiss a diagnosis because there might be a 5% uh, overlap with normal patients. That suggests that 95% of the people who are testing positive on this probably have the condition. And, and so it, these are just people who sound like it's not in their wheelhouse. So find somebody who it's in your wheelhouse. And, and I would specifically go look up a vascular surgeon who has experience in this. Uh, they're more likely to take this seriously. And if the, it's a vascular surgeon that's telling you that it's not real, um, I would find one who is known to be a, as thoracic outlet syndrome knowledgeable. Priyanka, you probably deal with stuff like this fairly frequently. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with um, Dr. Jenkins. I think that, again, it goes back to getting second opinions, but also... Um, I think it is kind of odd that if only 5% overlap normal, that's probably true for any symptom. If you looked at lumbar radiculopathy, if you looked at any anything actually probably that's true, and if not more true, then I could probably reproduce a lot of symptoms in any of us for other pain conditions that absolutely people don't have. So I certainly think a 5% rate, I would argue, is very low. I would say that if there's only a 5% overlap, then you really need a vascular opinion. And I would probably see a pain doctor or, team or someone well-versed in CRPS who can differentiate these things, discuss, you know, what they think about both. But I mean, a 5% rate, that in of itself is just very low. I would not be comforted by the fact, I mean, if you told me someone's having a stroke, but 5% of people have normal, the same right. symptoms, I wouldn't not send you to the hospital. So, right. I mean, I think a 5% rate is very low, and I would argue that first, but I think getting referrals to specialists who know TOS, vascular syndromes, both, I think that's very important. Uh, you, you deal with a decent amount of CRPS, don't you? Yeah, and, I do. So, I do a ton of CRPS stuff. And do you find it difficult to distinguish CRPS from TOS? So, you know, I think that both are syndromes. They both have waxing and waning components. I think CRPS is a little bit more specific in its onset, its neurology, that being said, and we can have a whole soapbox of my thoughts on CRPS being underdiagnosed and the Budapest criteria not always being sufficient. And I think I tell my patients from a high level perspective, whether it's TOS or it's CRPS, it is dysregulation of the nerves, dysregulation of the bundle. And it's very difficult to distinguish that and have consistent symptoms ever. And so I think if people start showing either symptom I work hard on differentiating them, but also treating it pretty aggressively early. And I think that's really key. But I mean, in this scenario, 5% after such a bad accident, I think every avenue should be immediately explored. David, we're already connected by email. We can talk uh, offline here, and I can connect you with any of our three experts here. And I'm happy to. Hi, Christoph. I saw Dr. Newkirk talk. What does your scapular repositioning involve? Does it elevate the scapula alone, or is the objective of the move to also upward rotate or posteriorly tilt the scapula. Thanks. It's basically all of the above. So again, think of the sush. Okay, the most common position of weakness in in mild to moderate TOS even is that both shoulder blades, not necessarily equally, are lower on the back than they should be. So that's called ptosis. Almost all of them are spread much farther apart than usual. Most have some degree of elevation of the medial or the inside border, and oftentimes there's a malrotation, so the, the, the point of the scapula rotates out more than it should. So the cor corrective maneuver that the examiner does, that I do ad nauseum, I mean hundreds of thousands by now, I don't know. But anyway, both shoulder blades are then compressed against the posterior thoracic wall, the back of the chest, if you will, moved upward, rotated back into neutral, but then held there. And in that in that position, what I see most of the time that, you know, we grade headache zero to 10. I can see a six or seven or eight out of 10 headache go to zero to one. Well, the record is about 30 seconds, but it takes a minute or two. The same for tingling in the feet. Uh, if, if I have help or if I tape the shoulder blades into that position, you can, I, Okay, I'll brag. The record increase in grip strength in two minutes is 37, 39 pounds. And that grip increase can be sustained indefinitely if the scapular position is held. Well, you can't stay tape because the tape I use is so strong it tears up the skin and 
six or eight hours. So it's not a sustainable correction. It's a diagnostic test. But headache will disappear. Tingling in the feet will disappear. And what's really fascinating, which I confess, I, one of the many, many things I can't explain, chronic brain fog that people have been told is stress or you're anxious or this, that, and the other. Well, people are anxious because they're disabled, not the other way around. Brain fog will clear. As I said, grip strength goes up. Most people will go up six to 10 pounds in, in a minute or two. And that's sustained as long as the scapula is corrected. Tingling goes away. And, and keep in mind, pain is multifactorial. Strength is multifactorial. But numbness and tingling is always neurologic. There's no other cause. Find the nerve somewhere and you'll have your answer. So that correction, if it's done correctly, and it's really easy to do, of course, when you do 20,000 of them, it's easy to do, I suppose, but it's, it's not a treatment. It tells people that if work is done to keep the space open, and I do it with periscopular strengthening mostly, but keep it open, then you can expect a far improved outcome. I have personally undergone uh, this with Dr. Newkirk, having my strength, grip strength measured, putting on the vest, right? And having right. the vest adjusted to reposition my shoulders and I, I felt a drastic difference. Um, I, you've also gotten your fingers underneath my shoulder blades and really moved them a lot, surprising oh, amount for me. And it makes a big difference. And it's fascinating. I don't know if it's again because of venous compression and congestion, but something's happening over the space of 30 to 60 seconds. Yeah. Well, it, in most neurologic changes that are, are pathologic don't occur in seconds, it occurs over time. Right. So vascular changes are far and away the most common. And we have to argue how, how much is venous, how much is arterial. Well, it's more arterial than we are able to prove with imaging because we can't image people in these active positions. So mm -hmm. venous changes, uh, in people who are taped, for example, the improvements evolve. So most of it occurs in a minute or two, literally. But there are additional changes that occur over the next 20 minutes that then can be sustained. The physical finding that's the most difficult to influence is edema or you know swelling above the clavicles. So the fastest I've ever seen advanced edema in this area clear with complete scapular correction is six to seven hours. The interesting mm -hmm. enigma is sometimes it doesn't go away even though all the other symptoms improve and sometimes it goes away and the others don't and nobody on earth, especially me can explain that those contradictions, but you know, you can know within one to two minutes if decompression is a sufficient approach, let's put it that way. Thank you for the question, Christoph. Very good question. Herb, do we have another audience question here? Yes, we do. Tyler, hi, Tyler, Dr. Malley. Dr. Ghosh, can you talk about your approach to chronic pain as an entity that may persist longer than the anatomic cause of TOS? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So I think that happens pretty regularly with TOS, but other syndromes as well. And it kind of depends on the specific patient. So if it's functionality that is the problem with pain, then I try to do more of a you know physical therapy-based approach. If it's their sleep, if it's it depends on what region of the chronic pain it is. And then it becomes more of a chronic pain uh, question. And for chronic pain, it really depends on the individual patient. I will integrate things all the way from nutrition and sleep. I will try to help them with medications, of course, physical therapy, stretches, positioning. I think one of the main things I love, because I have one, and I mean, it's amazing is Dr. Newkirk's vest, so orthoses. There's a lot of things that even when your generator is cleared, it there's a lot that we can help with. Um, and I think the one thing I always tell my pain patients in general is there's probably a lot of things causing your pain we just haven't figured out yet, whether it's inflammatory markers or um, muscle tension, things like that. And so I try to at least elucidate the cause, the main causation of it and help treat the symptoms of that. And I think that generally ends up being pretty multimodal. So whether it's with multiple specialists, altering nutrition, altering, supplements, medications. It really depends on the patient. Any other add-on comments? And I definitely have the specialists also kind of their thoughts often. 
Yeah, I, I think I just I want to echo something Dr. Newkirk said earlier, which is that when you had a, a problem that's gone on for more than two years, it rarely can be completely alleviated. There's often permanent changes to some of the nerves. So part of the, the approach to chronic pain is often, even after you've eliminated the pain generator, some pain may persist. And so there are things that need to be done to manage the chronic pain, the symptom that persists even after the compression has gone on. And I see this in multiple neurologic problems that you can operate on. If you can fix the anatomic problem, and they still don't get 100% relief. Uh, uh, and, and the longer it goes on, the, the, the less complete the relief often is. Not always, uh, but, but generally that's the way to bet. I think the one thing I will add is that pain waxes and wanes and it changes in its presentation, not predictably often. So I think working with the changes as they occur is very important too. Um, I think that constantly reassessing what's bothering you and how they all fit together is another big component of it. And I agree the longer it's gone on, the more it is something that is more you know, persisting. But that being said, sometimes you can find the right pain management techniques and I never have to say that. So we're really on the spectrum. Okay, we've been on, we've been going for an hour and a half. I wanna first of all, thank uh, each of our participants, not only for their expertise, but their willingness to share. Uh, thank you, Dr. J. Thanks, Dr. Newkirk. Thanks, Dr. Ghosh. It's just a pleasure to listen to you all. <laughs> and we have another talk coming up in two weeks. Um, uh, anybody who's viewing and wants to reach one of our excellent docs, please reach out to me at tosmri.com. I'm going to remind people, hit the like button. What do they say? Mash the like button. Help us out because it spreads the word if we're getting more likes subscribe so you can learn when our next uh, video is coming up or is published. We plan to be doing uh, some new short videos very soon. Uh, again, I'm Dr. Scott Warden, the TOS guy. Uh, we deal with TOS. We're really happy to help out all patients. And uh, uh, thanks again, everybody. Thanks for attending. And thanks, docs, for all your expertise. Been a pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good luck, everybody. And hopefully you could find the uh, a pathway to a better place. Don't give up. If you persist, you'll get there. See you guys. Okay, bye-bye.